October. And I know when we get older we always say that, but hasn't this year unbelievably? <laughs> I laugh because one of my wee nieces was around at the house yesterday and she's three. And she was saying in her daddy's tractor, she was in the tractor, that she wanted to be six. I don't know why she wanted to be six, but she wanted to be six anyway. And she's three and she's she's a handful like she's dynamite. But her sister said, and she was right, but the way she said it was, you have your whole life to live again before you get to six. And I thought, that's actually true. Like for us, three years is like nothing. But for Annie, it's like our whole lifetime again, you know? So everything is in a context, isn't it? But I'm looking forward to my lifetime again. That would make me 104. You know, that's the plan anyway. Everybody in here wanting to get a whole lifetime again. Yeah. Um, so we're on to James chapter 5, 7 to 12. Uh, I read from the ESV. And as always, I like to let you know that one of the books that I've used for this is R.T. Kendall's book on the on his teaching from the book of James. We're nearly there. Four more months will get us through this. I don't know about you. I know I say it every month, but I absolutely love teaching from the book of James. Um, it has become a bit of a theme over the last couple of years. I've started on my online class teaching through the book of Acts now as well, which is, uh, I'm really enjoying that. So I don't know if I'll move on to that after we do James for you guys or not. But... If it's took us two years to get through the book of James, I'm not too sure how long it might take to get through the book of Acts, which is 28 chapters. But hey, I've got 52 years left, you know. So, you know, there's a lot of time there. So let's read uh, chapter 5 of James, verses 7 through to 12 today. And it's entitled here in the ESV as Patience and Suffering. Verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not crum grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those who blessed, who remained steadfast. You have heard the, of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Okay, where's my notes gone? Oh, there they're there. Okay, um, so James, it's interesting how... When you look at scripture, uh, first of all, it all makes sense, all right? We'll go with that. And how it all ties together. I love the, I love how the Bible ties together from start to end. I really do. Um, but even the book of James here has done a full circle, which, again, I love to see as well whenever you're looking at things as a whole in scripture. And so you look at how the book of James starts. You all know how the book of James starts in chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all pure joy. Whenever you face trials of every kind and you think way back when, whenever we started looking at that and you've read it many times before, that doesn't make sense. But it does, but it doesn't, but it does. You know that sort of moment of when you read something like that? And then whenever James starts off like that and then he goes through the whole piece of really going to town on the first century Christians and by extension us in the 21st century whenever we look at it and then gets back around again to talking to those faithful people in the church the remnant and as we finish now out chapter 5 over these next four months or so um, you will see that James now goes back he's ready he's told all of those people the way they should not be living in last month when we looked at the start of five whenever he absolutely slaughtered the rich if you remember and so we looked at that last week, but now he goes back again, right to the end. He's back talking to the faithful, the faithful in the church. And so he's moved from the oppressor within the church back to the oppressed within the church. And the remainder of this epistle, the remainder of this book, 
is now directed to the proud rich, not directed now, sorry, to the proud rich Christians, but rather the remnant who have remained faithful. And so this would have seemed like great vindication to those within the church, great vindication to the oppressed within the church because of how they had been mistreated. But they, in turn, need to be careful with that. It's interesting that whenever we allow God to do vindicate, to vindicate, and you know I talk a lot about this because it's, it's through scripture, and particularly James, there's an awful lot of reference to that type of thing, is we let God deal with stuff. But it's, it's possible then whenever God does deal with stuff on our behalf, and we are blessed as a result of how that has went, that it's actually difficult then not to step across into a self-righteous place and thus undo really what the blessing is. So it's it gets really complicated in that regard as to how we live our lives, but we have to just remember God is in control of all things. Regardless of the outcome of that, we can't get pious about it. We can't. And so I think that's what James is doing now as he sort of closes out the book here. He's saying, look, well done. You've done a really, really good job, but finish well. Finish well. I don't know if I talked about that last month when I was here, about finishing well. I can't remember because I'm talking about many different places. I don't think I did. And I, I was with someone a few weeks ago, and he he's an 80-year-old man. He isn't able to get out to church because of his health. He comes on to uh, the online teaching that I do on a Monday night. He goes on to other things online. Online and Zoom has been his saving grace if you like because he's not well enough to get to church um and he's he's on a lot and he's on with me on a monday night he's fantastic but a friend of mine robert and i decided to go and see him and he had talked about wanting this man was 80 he wanted to finish well and i thought i love that phrase that you've just used and he gave a statistic about how many people finished well in the bible so i wanted to go back and sort of check that out so i did and i found this study that was carried out about leaders in the Bible and there's about a thousand according to them there's about a thousand leaders in the Bible throughout the Bible and do you know how many they have written has finished that finished well out of that a thousand one thousand three hundred thirty percent finished well and that's the the leaders in the Bible um and they also carried out some research into modern day living and the, the statistic still applies for modern day leaders 30 percent only 30 percent will finish well and so they didn't go as far as saying well what about everybody in the christian church but i would imagine the statistic must be the same or maybe even slightly worse um but 30 percent so do we want to finish well and that's what james is talking to about the, to these people do we want to no matter what age we are in this room do we want to finish well and of course we should say we want to finish well no matter who we are but do we really? And are we going to? And so that's what's happening here. James is sort of, he's, he's brought it round the houses. He's hammered those that needed hammered. He spoke very clearly. Like these Christians were no doubt as to what James meant. And so all of a sudden, he's coming around and saying like, okay, you've remained faithful, but be careful right to the end is basically what he's saying. And some of those oppressed people may even have had some kind of false guilt. They could even have looked at the others in inverted commas and thought that God was blessing the others because they were good. But no, and we've already covered that. We covered that very clearly last month. That was not the case. But you can see how maybe oppressed people can start to think like that. No, the oppressed were saving, serving the Lord. And it's absolutely important, regardless of what we see going on around us, regardless of timelines or anything like that, we are responsible for us. And if we're going to finish well, we've got to serve God in the here and now, every day. And James directs these Christians to the coming of the Lord. Verse 7, he says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And sometimes it could take to the coming of the Lord for us, if you, if you like, for total vindication. But remember, it's the Lord's job. The minute we get involved in that, the Lord says, Okay, then, you sort it out. And so the coming of the Lord here, whenever James says this to these Christians, can mean two things. It can actually mean the actual return of Jesus, because the word is parousia. And that means presence. And so whenever James said to them, be patient there for the coming of the Lord, you can understand that they would have taken that potentially as the Lord coming back physically in that moment in time. Now, we know that that didn't happen because here we are 2,000 years later and Jesus still has not returned. And so there had to be another meaning for that for those first century church. 
but also then the meaning for us could absolutely that the Lord will come in his physical presence whilst we are still alive. And I, I know everybody has said this for centuries, but I really believe that it will happen in our lifetime. Now, I know we've all said that, and people for centuries have said it, and I could be wrong. But I really don't, when I look around this world, I, I was away again since the last time I was here in a, a dark place. I was in California again, taking some meetings. And every time I go there, and I'm usually there a couple of times a year, honest to goodness, I every time you're there, you see that great state of California taking massive strides in a different direction than the church. Let's just say that. And some of the stuff whenever I'm out there that my Christian friends tell me about, and I go, oh my goodness. But the oh my goodness is actually, give it a few years, give it five years, and it's going to be here as well. And so you look at that and think, this world needs Jesus, and we need Jesus back now. But the other meaning here is that at, for, for the return of Jesus is a direct and spiritual intervention from Jesus, which was more relevant to the first century church, whilst Jesus still being seated at the right hand of God. So Jesus can come in our circumstances, or Jesus can come again. And it, but it means, it means the same thing for us, really, if you think about it. And so have the question as we start to sort of wind this up, is have you dignified the trial? Because James starts right there. We're going to face trials. If we don't, there's something actually wrong because that's the way of the cross. We have to face things. Have we tried to serve up our own vindication? Have we trusted God in everything? There is a time when God will step in if you're faithful. He always will. And so James gives the example of Job. And again, you know I'll often talk about Job. He talks about Elijah later on. And we'll come back to that in the coming months because he, he refers to Job and Elijah and he talks about prophets. But the example of Job is always a fascinating one. And it's, and it's in the sense that in their waiting, so Job's waiting, that something would happen and God would step in. Job's one of those little anomalies in the Bible. It's not related to anything else. It's, it's not related to the history of the church the, the, or the Israelites. It's just there. Now, that when I say that, I don't mean that it's just there and shouldn't be there. I love the book of Job, but it's absolutely there for us. But it's like a set aside. It's probably the oldest text as well, the oldest written book. But it's interesting that it's there because we can learn so much from it. But in, right at the end of Job or halfway through that last chapter of Job and it says and the Lord blessed the latter days of Job Job more than his beginning and so here we are at the end of the book of James whenever James is talking about Job all right so and then when you go back to Job it's interesting that that God clearly says look I'm going to bless you more now than I ever did and so if we want to finish well the challenge is we can be blessed more now than we ever were if we get what James is saying, yeah, that's really what's going on. And so James is saying to be patient, like the farmer who has to be there for the early and the late rains to reap the harvest. Can you imagine if every farmer took the potatoes out of the field after the first set of rains? It probably wouldn't be great spuds, I wouldn't imagine. Um, so there has to be that second set. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes a trust. But you can expect a deliverance because if if you don't go through a trial, it means no blessing. Because that's what's going on. That's what's going on and right through the book of James. And that's what's going on here in verse 8, that there has to be two sets of rain in order to bear the fruit. Don't try to abort the process. Don't go for a half blessing or no blessing at all. It's process and progress. And that's so... Very often as Christians, we can't just quite get over the line because at some point we just decide that we know better ourselves. And it's so easy to do that, isn't it? It's so easy. Many times have I told you that we can pray about a particular situation and then give God ten solutions. And then God's going up there, well, then, mate, you don't need mine then. you got your own ten solutions. Now, I know it all sounds ridiculous whenever I say it, does it? Yeah, but hey, come on. Hands up. No, don't. Who's very good at praying about something and then saying, here's God, here, sort it out this way. You know, God's scratching his head again. He said, oh, will you ever learn? Don't try to abort what's going on. And so hold no grudges. Verse 9 says that. Do not grumble against one another. 
brothers so that you may not be judged behold the judge is standing at the door jesus is standing there and he's watching but do not grumble against one another i've said this time and time and time again that i believe this absolutely right here is the biggest issue in the church 100 percent is how we talk about people it's how we think of others and that's why the new testament has written a lot of the golden rule for example do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you the royal law love your neighbor as you love yourself Jesus said, people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. This is the biggest issue. And so here James is reminding the oppressed again, the faithful people in the church, do not grumble, even against the people who are oppressing you. Do not grumble against others, because then if you do, you're going to be judged too. And so remember that Job, before his deliverance, had also to prove that he was not holding any grudge. Very often we will have to deal with this kind of thing. James was reminding the oppressed people of the day of that. God will step in, but don't grieve him at the last minute. We're really, really good at that. And verse 10 would indicate that if you can endure suffering without murmuring, then that qualifies you for the school of the prophets. The school of the prophets. Do you want to qualify for the school of the prophets? And to be qualified to speak in the name of the Lord means that you will have to suffer. That's what the Bible says. The prophet cannot be on a political vendetta. It's so easy, and I hear it often. Um, And I travel lots, as you know, and I hear people speak sometimes, and I just sit back and think, oh, I wonder, you know, political sounds too political to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the church has to stand up for what's going on. I do believe that. But I think we have to be careful when we're standing here that it doesn't become a political message. And I can do, and I hear it often whenever I travel. We have to serve the Lord and speak the word always and seek God's face only. And we will speak his word, I believe, only. Matthew 5, 11 to 12 talks about the school of the prophets. This is right at the end of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus goes through those eight Beatitudes and then he repeats the eighth, if you like, and says this about it, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so if we want to be part of the school of the prophets and that is people who speak the word of God. Okay, so again we we sometimes make that something that it isn't but that's speaking the word of God into people's lives. If we want to be part of that, we have absolutely got to recognize that the only way to refine that is actually in the school of suffering, sacrifice and submission. And so James is happy here for the oppressed. He's happy because he recognizes the importance of that. And so does that make sense to us this morning? Hopefully in that we can start to grasp here what's happening throughout the book of James. What James, the overall message that he's trying to betray, never read a text in isolation. You've got to look at it in the context of everything that is being said. And hopefully over these two years, we've started to really get to this fine point that now, and you can understand what is actually going on in scripture. And so for us, that kingdom living is about being oppressed. Now, we don't get up in the morning and look for oppression. It'll find you, all right? So you don't need to go looking for it. But... That's actually where we need to be. And so whenever we do that and we are persecuted or we are reviled or people say stuff about us, regardless of whether it's within inside the room or outside of the room, that's not our responsibility because everything's about blessing. Everything's about future reward. Everything's about inheritance. Everything's about kingdom. Do you not think God's going to get done what God needs to do anyway? And so you and I, each day we live, we have an opportunity and responsibility to live for God and finish well. A few verses, Colossians 1, 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Philippians 1, 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. 1 Peter 4, 13, 14. But rejoice in so far as you were you share share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed if you're insulted for the name of Christ you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you I mean this is all in the Bible not a popular theology 
but it's there. We don't go looking for it, but that's what the Bible says. And so if we want to be complete and finish well, we actually have to recognize that that's what we have to go through our suffering. Because it's only by going through our suffering that we recognize our weakness. Think about that. Because suffering is the ultimate proof that you're a child of God and that he's going to use you. And so it's only if I go through a particular issue that I recognize how I'm going to deal with that or not deal with that, and that creates my weakness. Does that make sense? So if I'm going to get angry at a particular issue, then obviously that weakness is the anger. But if I hadn't went through the difficulty, I wouldn't have recognized that. And same if I'm going to worry about stuff. I'm not going to worry about something if I don't have to get through something. That's going to, you, know, you know what I'm saying? And so our suffering actually brings to the surface what it is that we have to deal with. And that's why it's such a biblical principle. And you'll not hear it too much on those religious channels and television. So what is the controversy surrounding Job and why does he get a mention here? Verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job was a good man. We know that. You only have to read chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Job and it clearly states in both chapters that Job did not sin. It says it, says it there. Go read it. But as it goes through the next 40 chapters or so, Job becomes self-righteous. He starts to struggle because the suffering brings the issue to the surface. So the issue wasn't there in chapter 1 and chapter 2. God knew what it was, and so that's what was actually going on. Job was considered patient. We talk about the Job, the patience of Job. But we know if you read chapter 1 and chapter 2 that God set him up. People don't like to hear that type of phrase, but that's exactly what happened. And we know that he didn't sin at the start. But these three so-called friends of his, one of them was quite small, by the way. He was called Bill Dad the Shoe Height. Come on, go with me. That's a joke. All right, Bill Dad the Shoe Height. Very small, okay. Anyway, that's for free this morning. Okay, (laughs) Job was a good man, all right. But these three friends... One short one, two big ones came along, right? And they tried to convince him that there was something wrong in his life for him to suffer like that. Now, I'm not saying that that's not always the case, by the way. We absolutely may suffer because we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. That's there in the Bible too. But for Job, it wasn't. And for others, it isn't. So you never jump to that conclusion because that sometimes is a conclusion that people jump to, but it's not always the case. But it became an issue for Job. That's why he gets a mention here because... Do you often think like that, that people suffer because of something in their lives? It's possible, but very equally, it's not. And so these friends became the brunt of his trial. These friends actually became Job's trial. And so why did Job mention, why is Job mentioned then in the book of James? Well, because James sees the suffering of the Christians in the church, and he's writing to them. And he sees that as an extension of the suffering of Job because Job's suffering was actually at the hands of his friends, other believers. Now, we know that Job's suffering at the start, he lost his family and his health and lost everything that he had, but his suffering became what his friends were saying. His suffering became the, the, his wounds from other believers. Is that possible? Come on, think about it. Is that possible in this world that we live in? Of course it is. Not only did Job lose his possessions, but he had to forgive those who wronged and falsely accused him. He could hold no grudge. So now Job was not a model of perfection. We know that because by the end of it, he was as bad as his friends and just as self-righteous as them. That's what bubbled to the surface for Job. And so that's the reason why he went through it, so that that would bubble up and that he would recognize it and then that he, he could actually deal with it. And that's what James is getting at here. And so all the time Job wanted God to deal with his friends, but actually God was dealing with him instead. You may think, that's really unfair. I mean, you probably probably know enough about the book of Job to think, that seems a bit unfair. Here he's doing a really good job, and God goes, I'm just about to give you a big problem, mate. And I'm going to see how you react to it, and then see at the end, you're going to have to forgive them boys that I've just put in your life type of thing. And you think, what's because God knew what God needed to get from Job. And so whenever we face what we're facing, God knows what he needs to get from us, if we're going to finish well or not. And it's interesting that verse 40 
sort of chapter 42 of Job, verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. Are you able to do that one? Are you? Are you able to pray for those who hurt you? But then church, hmm? doesn't happen, does it? So James is saying to the early Christians that he doesn't want them to miss out on what God was doing. They needed to keep their hearts right. God wants to bless you too. And so much besides, if you completely surrender to him. Verse 9 there says, God is waiting. He's waiting at the door. And that's an example of patience for you because God will eventually step in. He cannot bear to see you suffer, but he will let it happen for your own sake. Because that is the way of the cross. So remember then that James told them not to grumble against each other because in doing so that they would be judged because it's about suffering and grace. That's the hardest thing in the world to do, isn't it? Think about it. Have we even done it today? Hmm, probably. That's why I believe it's the biggest issue in the church. I absolutely do. And the more I read these things, the more I teach these things, the more I recognize this absolutely is the issue. And, so it, and to this point, these Christians, these oppressed Christians in the book of James, in that first century church, had managed to turn the other cheek and had been growing in grace and bringing great blessing on themselves. And James is just saying, keep it up. Keep it up. Keep doing that. Finish well. And so here then in verse 12, it's interesting that he uses the phrase, but above all, I love things they got in scripture, but equally I don't love it. Because it means something really important is coming. Okay, the one that I can think of there is Romans 12, 1, where it says, Therefore, therefore is another word in the Bible that you read and go, Whoa, what's coming? All right, so the scene has been set. Therefore, right? And we don't like probably the therefore of Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, because this is holy and pleasing to God, right? Okay. So here he says in verse 12, but above all. All right, so here's what I've just told you, but remember this piece. Do not forget it. He says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. This is, this is, this is a strong challenge coming up right now. I'm just going to prepare you for it. And James now starts by quoting his brother Jesus actually. And we've talked about this James probably was the brother of Jesus. And he quotes him from the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 33 to 35. He says, and again you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, this right here is what is known as taking the name of the Lord in vain. This is the third commandment right here. How often have people thought the third commandment is by using Jesus' name in a swear word? Now, that's not right. should never be done. But it's not what the third commandment talks about. The third commandment talks about taking the Lord's name in vain. In other words, in other words attributing something to God that's not necessarily God. And I'm not talking about speaking the word because we speak the word because that is God and we know that's God. But if we take the name of the Lord in vain and use it, it's manipulating God or the high name of God for personal gain. And that's what's going on in this verse here, this verse 12. And to do that to God, think about it. This is not about taking an oath in court, by the way. And I suppose there's just a little bit of an aside here. Some Christians struggle with the idea of taking an oath in court. That's not what this says here. Nothing wrong with promising to tell the truth in court, by the way. And people sometimes get hung up on that, and they shouldn't, because that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is using God's name to verify something whenever God maybe didn't say it. I call that the, Trump, the God Trump card. Are you familiar with Trump cards? Trump cards is a game that we probably, most of us grew up with. Maybe the younger ones didn't. A Trump card is like if you've got the... 50 cards of cars, for example. The fastest car wins the, the Trump and the whatever, biggest engine or the whatever. You know, right? Trump cards, best footballer, that kind of thing. 
well, I call this the God Trump card because I've been in meetings. I've been in leadership meetings. I've been around circles for a long, long time, in Christian circles, and very often someone in the room will use the God Trump card. And now it's wrong. And that's what James is saying. It is wrong if someone says, God says, if God didn't say it. And, and, I, and we're in de- this is serious stuff. Now, it doesn't, and I'm not talking about if something is said clearly in the Bible. That's not what I'm talking about. But I've been in meetings where someone says, basically, it's a mic drop moment. It's God says, and then everybody just goes, well, then if God says it, well, that's what we're just going to do. But did God say it? That's the point I'm making. And so whenever James is saying here, you don't swear by God at all. You don't. You let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yes, we use the word of God. We're not saying that we do not use the word of God to make decisions about things if it's clear in the word of God. But whenever we're standing there using the trump card, that's manipulation at its best. And I'm telling you from my personal experience that the church is full of it. I have witnessed it many, many times over the my years, and I've been involved in church leadership, you know that, I've been involved in parachurch leadership, and the amount of times that somebody who should know better in the room says something, and all of a sudden it's dealt with. And I'm going, no. Different if we make a decision based around what the Bible says we should or shouldn't do. Not saying that, but I'm saying that if I, in a position that I'm in, James 3, 1, I'll get judged more harshly, if I turn around and say, God told me to tell you this. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't speak in words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and prophecy. I'm not saying that either. But if I use that in a moment in time, and I imply that somehow I've had a direct communication from God, then actually I'm doing what Revelation 22 says that I shouldn't, and I'm adding to the word of God. It's wrong. Okay, so there's a challenge here. Do not use the God trump card unless it's clearly in the Bible. Does that make sense? And that's what James is saying. Because James are, and Jesus, whenever we quoted him a minute or two ago, is saying that the proof that you don't want to exploit the name of God or any other is that you don't swear by his name or any other name at all. You let your yea be yea and your no be no and let people take what it is that they need to take from that. What's the difference in me saying here's what I think about a particular thing? That's what the room is there for, to talk about something in the context of why not do this. But I can think of scenarios in my life where someone said, God says no. And all of a sudden, everybody in the room just shuts up. I'm not saying we should fight and argue, but I'm saying, who gave that person the authority to say that in that moment in time? If it's not a clear thing from scripture, do you understand what I'm saying? And so we say, here's what I think. And whenever we are in our circles, think so I want you to drum this down in your own personal life. Whenever we're in conversations, if we say something like that, you have to be f- fairly certain that you're saying something that's clear. I'm holding my phone up because my Bible's on it. Yeah? That it's written in the Word of God. And it's not what your personal opinion is. And all of a sudden, I'm just dressing that up as what God said. That's dangerous. That's what James is saying. And he's saying it to the oppressed Christians in this moment in time be careful let your word be your word you don't bring God into it or indeed heaven or anything else vindication has to be in God's realm and in his time don't put God on the spot those who are abusing you if that's what's going on here are Christians as well God is no respecter of persons, remember, chapter 2, and he loves them as well. So we've got to give every scenario over to God. We cannot turn around and say, this situation is this way, and God says it, so therefore you're wrong. That's not right. And so even if you're suffering, don't invoke God's name. If you do, you can get drawn back right into it, into the plight, and will remove God's feelings in place of your own. You might just get another wee while, because you haven't quite got there yet. And that could only lead to bitterness for you. And you can see how the cycle starts to go downward. So that's why James is actually saying, you've done really well to this point, but don't lose sight of what it is that you're doing. Don't name drop God, in other words. And that is the trump card, and it's wrong. Spiritual pride. If you're determined to prove how close to God you are by doing so, you show actually how far you actually are from him. And so any given scenario, if something's going on against you, And that's probably a more clear, specific example of this. 
If something is going on against you in a moment in time, doesn't matter what it is, you've got to leave it to God. You can't say God says, because that's not your call. Yeah. So this would have become self-righteousness if we did or we allowed that to happen. Swearing oaths is the essence of this. God loves all Christians the same. Let God deal with all things. Will you qualify to speak for God? This is about suffering. And you're not on your own. I know there's a bit of a challenge there at the end. I don't ever want to speak if there isn't a challenge because what's the point if there isn't? And it's the challenge of the Word of God, hopefully. And as always, we like to give people who are watching the opportunity to respond to Jesus. The opportunity to do that. Very often, we might have a church full of believers and yet people get saved. And I've seen it in meetings that I've been in where you were, you're convinced that everybody in the room is a Christian. But we also have the opportunity now because the majority of services that I speak in is online somewhere. And so that opportunity is people in the room but people watching if you don't know Jesus as your own personal saviour give your life to him there's opportunities if you're watching it in video you'll know how to contact the church here and other Christians if you know them but don't spend a day without Jesus ever give your life to him believe that he died on the cross for you repent turn away from your life of sin and strive towards him but equally also if you're a believer here this morning and you're a believer watching the tape. We need to live for Jesus the way Jesus told us to live for him. And whenever you read the word of God, we can see in the New Testament that actually we're not that good at living for God. And I'm not here to beat you with that today. I'm actually here to help you recognize that actually we're all in the same boat. And we have this opportunity to serve God and Jesus as best as we can and finish well. Let's do that. Yeah. And let's not try and invoke stuff that's not reality. Because we've got to sit back and recognize, God, it doesn't matter what happens. It does not matter one bit what happens as long as I serve you and trust you. And if you decide for whatever reason to allow X, Y, or Z, whatever the case might be, whatever suffering I have to face, we can't be Christians and not trust God. That's the point. And so I just want to pray for us in closing. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for what it says. Lord, we thank you for the challenge that it brings us each and every day. Lord, we love it all. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the book of James. Lord, we thank you that your brother probably wrote this book for us. Lord, we thank you that he's so clear and that he's so pointed and he's so directed at. And, Lord, we need that. We need to see that, but we need to live by it, Lord. We need to take the principles, not only of the book of James, but of the entire Bible. And we need to live it. Because, Lord, we know that the word of God is actually the will of God. And that's what we should do each and every day. And, Lord, I know that very often we don't. And so, Lord, forgive us when we don't. But, Lord, help us each and every day to get up and think, I'm going to finish well. And even if tomorrow isn't my last day I should still live it like it is and so Lord please just help us to live and serve you Lord I just pray Lord that people watching this who don't know you Lord will give their lives to you will respond to you and Lord we just thank you for this opportunity in Jesus name we pray Amen